put in my heart a psalm. And it's a psalm I've turned to many times, but I really felt the Lord put it on my heart for you folks tonight. The last time I was here, I was ministering on the overcomer. Wasn't I? And the Holy Spirit putting it on as a covering. And I was sharing with Merle afterwards, and it was the first of the characteristics in the chapter. And in my mind, I was thinking, I think I'll carry on with that, Lord, but the Lord had other plans, maybe another time. But Psalm 42 is what we are going to read from God's Word tonight. As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for your God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? My tears have been my food day and night, while men say to me all day long, just where is your God? For these things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I used to go with the multitude, leading the procession to the house of God, with shouts of joy and thanksgiving among the festive throng. Why are you downcast, O my soul, and why is so disquieted within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Saviour and my God. But my soul is downcast within me. Therefore I will remember you from the land of the Jordan, the heights of Hermon, from Mount Isa, deep cause to deep, in the roar of your waterfalls. And all your waves and breakers have swept over me. By day the Lord directs his love, and at night his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why must I go about mourning, oppressed by the enemy? My bones suffer mortal agony as my foes taught me, saying to me all day long, Where is your God? Why are you downcast, O my soul? Why so disquieted within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Saviour and my God. Hannah sounds a little depressing, that psalm, doesn't it? You're probably thinking, what in the world have I come to listen to? But you know, I just love the Word of God, and I love the psalms particularly, inspired by the Holy Spirit, where God has given us a little insight to people's hearts and the reality of how people feel. And I believe that many of us, even in here tonight, in fact all of us, at one time or another, or maybe even tonight, have felt or you feel as the psalmist is feeling hopeless. I want to talk about being hopeless tonight, but we're not going to stay hopeless, okay? He says, as the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for your God. He says, my soul, that is mind, will, and emotions, is cast down. In other words, I feel fed up and depressed and miserable within me. Why art thou cast down on my soul? And he goes on to say, the enemy taught me, ridiculed me, reproached me, and they're continually nagging me, one translation says, continually saying to me, well, just where is your God? Have you had people say that to you as a believer? Well, where is God? If there was a God in heaven, why are so many people starving? And if there is a God in heaven, why has my husband got cancer? And if there is a God, just where is your God? I believe this is a relevant word today. For the situations that we live in, it's real, it's reality, isn't it? It's what's going on in people's lives, especially those who don't know the Lord Jesus Christ. But the psalmist is expressing all kinds of mixed emotions, longings, deep desires, discouragement, and even depression. I hear a lot of people say, you can't be depressed when you're a Christian. <laughs> Hello? You can, but you don't stay there, amen? In other words, all these feelings and all these emotions and all these longings and desires are very real to all of us, aren't they? Because we're emotional beings, it's what we are. But he's feeling hopeless, he's feeling abandoned. And he's asking, why is all this happening to me? You know, I honestly believe not just unbelievers and people out there in the world, outside of the church, but even people in the church are expressing this kind of feeling. In fact, I was in Landon only on Wednesday night for Women's in Love and I was hours afterwards counselling with people, Christians who were saying, gee, I feel that worn out. I feel that worn down and worn out. And I don't understand. I don't understand what's going on. And they've lost their hope. They've lost their hope. It's very relevant today. Where's God in all of this? You know when you feel like this, and we've been there, I'm sure. I certainly have. Sometimes in my life, I've been there. You know what you tend to do when you're feeling all those emotions? You 
You tend to put walls all around you, don't you? You put walls all around you. And you say to yourself, well, I don't trust anybody anymore. Nobody's going to get close to me again. They let me down big time. And you even don't trust God. And you get to a place where you literally become hopeless. Hopeless. He says, why must I go about mourning, oppressed by the enemy, taunted? In other words, the devil's having a heyday in my life. Satan sitting on my shoulder. <laughs> no, we're in a spiritual battle, aren't we, even as the church, as believers. He sits on our shoulder, and we're praying, and we're praying, and we're believing, and we're believing, and another year goes by, and we're believing, and we're believing, and another year goes by, and ten years, and we're still believing God for the same thing. And Satan kind of nibbly, he nags you, doesn't he? He's literally, he's, you know, you may as well quit, you may as well give up. Well, it is God. He's not listening to you. What to encourage you tonight? Believe me, stay with me. But when you're feeling like this, you can't seem to touch God anymore. You've lost something. Hope seeps away. You know, that word hope is defined in many ways. It literally means, in the, the dictionary definition of it, is confidence, refuge, waiting, expectation, a certainty, an assurance. All these lovely words define this word. But it's 48 times used directly in the Bible and thousands of times indirectly referred to. But you know, in Hebrews 10, 23, it's translated faith, faithless. And many in the body of Christ, in, even in the church, have a vacant look. Nothing is positive anymore. And the psalmist is coming to a place where he's not stopped believing in God. He's just lost the sense of the reality of God in his life. In other words, I don't kind of feel I can touch God. I don't kind of feel his presence like I used to. And I know a lot of Christians, and they've expressed to me, even this week in counseling, you know, there was a time, Gene, when I just felt the anointing and the presence of God, and I'd get in the closet, and oh, and it was so real and alive, but, you know, time's gone on, and I still love the Lord, and I'm serving the Lord in the church, and I carry on serving Him, but I'm not where I was. I'm not where I was. And I believe it's time for us all to take inventory and to, to own up God wants truth in the inward parts. In fact, it's only when we come clean and say what we're really feeling can God do anything about it. Because we tend to put on a mask, don't we? When we come into church, maybe you don't hear, I think this is a wonderful church. You're all smiles and friendly with one another. But, you know, and I'm not talking about you, okay? But let me talk maybe new life. You know, we come in and you say, you know what, I don't praise the Lord. And then afterwards they get talking and they tell you, I said, I thought you were all right when you come. Well, you've got to say that, haven't you? Oh, bless you, praise the Lord, and we sing the songs, but we've got all this baggage and all this emotion and all this depression, and we don't say anything because people will look down on us and think, well, you shouldn't say that, you're a Christian. As though we were not living up to something. You know, we can we become very hypocritical, don't we? We can put on a church mask. I call it the church mask. <laughs> you know, we've all done this, haven't we? Every one of us has done this. And I trust this word will just kind of stir your hearts tonight and just encourage you. Because this psalmist is being so real about his situation. He's not stopped believing in God, but he's lost a sense of his reality. He goes on to say in verse 3, Tears have been my meat day and night, while they continually say to me, Where is your God? In other words, I'm in a pool of tears, my own tears, and my meat, he said, they're my food day and night. In other words, he's feeding on his own situation. We would call it a pity party. He's having a good cry and a good moan and he said, oh, if only you knew what I was going through. You, you really understand. You know, and, and he's feeding on that. He said, it's my food day and night. He's feeding on that. And he's living in continual defeat. Cast down. He's had, actually, I love him, you know. He, he's doing what I do. He's having a debate with himself. He's talking to himself. He's kind of saying, why art thou cast down, O oh my soul? It's like talking, you talking to me, gee, well, pick yourself up. Why are you feeling miserable today? You know, and I think it's good sometimes. Out there, they kind of lock you up and put you in, in all this park or something. But, you know, he's being realistic. He's being realistic. And he comes to a decision. He comes to a decision. He isn't going to put his hope in himself and how he feels. He says, hope down, God. Big difference. Hope down, 
in God. Will you get nothing else tonight? Go home with those two words. Hope thou in God. Don't put your hope in anyone else. Don't put it in me. Don't put it in the leadership. Don't put it in anyone. Hope thou in God. Don't put it in how you feel and your situation, your circumstances. God's in control of that. And we may not understand just what he's doing, but we've got to put our hope in a God who is faithful, who does everything right, who's a good father, who wants the best for us, amen, who will never let us down. We're going to come to an understanding in a little while why we can put our hope in this God. He said, and I will remember thee, and I will thank thee. And he's opening up the channels of communication. He determines by an act of his will that he's going to pull himself together because he has no hope in himself. He has no hope for himself. He can't see a way out of his situation, but he's going to put his hope in God. And you might be saying to me, oh, gee, that's, that's, uh, that's way off being, you know. I mean, if you're feeling like this, how in the world could you put, could you, by, by an act of your will, when you don't feel like, how could you even do that, even as a believer? But, you know, it goes on to say in the Word of God, it is God who works in you, both to will and to do of your good pleasure. Amen. So even when you are not willing, then we will just, oh, even a sigh, even a cry, even a tear, he interprets it as a prayer. Oh, God, help me, you know. I think when things are going well, we pray really eloquent King James prayers, don't we? But when we really get a crisis, we haven't got the word. It's just, oh. In fact, it's not even worse. I've been through some real crisis in my life, especially when I was on the mission field. Real crisis in my life, especially when I had typhoid and I was put in a third, in a third world hospital, cattle to the bed, giving me kittens. I was in a ward where there was an epidemic of typhoid and I'm lying there and I'm the only white person because everybody wants to have a little look and all the students that are learning nursing and are, are coming around watching, help, you know, having a bit of fun. And, and I'm lying there feeling like death and I was told I wouldn't recover. In fact, the Filipinos, you know, you've got a lot of different cultures. We would never do this here because it's not British. But Filipinos are dead straight. And the nurses and doctors were coming down and telling me, this is the absolute truth. You are dying, man. You are dying. <laughs> Thanks, you know. And sure enough, there were people all around me and they're putting the sheet over their heads and they're leaving them in the, in the, 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 in the, the war there. That isn't a ward. You've got to see a third world hospital. It's just beds and on a cement floor and there's cockroaches everywhere, you know. It's just unbelievable. It's third world conditions. And I'm lying there and all these people have got these blankets and sheets over there, which incidentally were not white and clean. And I'm told I'm not going to make it. Yeah, I know what it's like to be in this situation. I know what it's like. Feeling abandoned. Feeling absolutely lost. But he's going to put his hope in God. He said, I will speak to him. He's opening up the lines of communication. But you know, in those situations when I've been in and you've been in and so many more, you could probably be in worse situations. When I haven't got the words and I haven't got the eloquent prayers, I've just said, oh, inside of me, I'm saying, oh, read me, I'm a prayer. Read me, I'm a prayer, you know? Because I ain't got the words, I don't understand it, they're feeling wrong. And that's exactly the way the psalmist is feeling. He is going to give up the struggle. He is going to give up completely and say, oh, I'm going to put my hope in you. It's over to you now, God. And he finds his deliverance. If our hope is in us, it's hopeless. But the psalmist is showing us a key. God is showing us the key. In his word, God is speaking through his word. It's not just a psalm to entertain him, it's God's word. God is saying, put your hope in me. It says in Psalm 62 and 5, My soul, wait only upon God and silently submit to him. For my hope and my expectation is from him. For I shall yet praise him, my help, my hope, and my God. You know, I want to encourage you tonight. We have a sure hope. In Jesus Christ. We have a sure hope. In fact, those of you who have put your trust in Jesus, those of you who have asked Jesus into your heart and are saved and born again, you walk through the door with hope. Because Colossians 1 and 29 says, Christ in you, the hope of glory. You carry hope. Next time you go to Astor or you're at the bus stop or you're walking down the road, you're carrying hope. You're never as a believer in a hopeless situation. Because hope is so much nearer than you think. It's within you. Jesus is our hope. And Hebrews 6 and 19 says, We have this hope. And I want to read this from the Amplified Bible because it's absolutely beautiful. We have this hope as an anchor, as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul that cannot slip, it cannot break down under whoever steps out upon it. A hope that reaches through. 
further and enters into the certainty of the presence within the veil. It goes on to say why we have such a one. By two unchangeable things, his promise and his oath, in which it is impossible for God ever to prove false to you, ever to deceive you. Those who have fled to him for refuge, that they might have mighty indwelling strength, strong encouragement to grasp and hold fast to the hope appointed for them and that is continually set before them. Don't you love the Amplified? What a sure hope we have. Steadfast and sure. You know, we sing or we used to sing the song, My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust. We've all lived, haven't we? We're living. I mean, I'm 60 now, but I tell you, I've known disappointments. I've let you down. You'll probably let me down once again. We've all, I'm sure, come through some things and come to the conclusion that we dare not trust even the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. He is the hope. He is the anchor, steadfast and sure. He will never, no, never disappoint you or fail you or let you down. Oh, hallelujah. What a hope. So if I'm exhorted tonight to put my hope in God, I want to know who this God is that I'm to put my hope in. I want to understand from the Word that He is that solid rock. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all of the ground is sinking sand. That's why I said to Gary a while ago, I was so blessed in the old holy cross. Oh, I tell you, we need from time to time to come back to the foot of the cross. I love the new songs. I love the songs. Some of the new songs are just songs. Hello? They're just songs. Written to throw out CDs as fast as they can. They're just songs. But there's some songs that have come through experience that have been born, birthed by the Spirit of God. And I want to tell you, the Old Roman Cross is one of them. And when you sing it, it brings you back to your foundations. It brings you back to why we can have such a hope. Because the Lord God Himself came down and laid aside His deity and put on flesh and came into our world and wasn't born in a fancy palace. He was born in a smelly stable and He became poor that you and I might become rich. And there isn't an emotion that you and I go through that he hasn't felt. I experienced that revelation more in the Philippines. We were there six, nine consecutive Christmases, but on the sixth, only came home for 12 weeks in nine years. But I remember the sixth Christmas. We hadn't come home. The sixth Christmas. And I was home sick. And I went in and lay on the floor and we played Scrabble for the millionth time, as you do, not million, but many times, you know. I'd gone to the market and bought the biggest chicken I could that was three pound six and dreamed of stuffing back home and, and all these Christmas things that you don't get out there and, and it was 44 degrees and I'm thinking all oh, that. And yeah, I was homesick. And I remember on Christmas Day, six years in the Philippines, and I remember crying on Christmas Day. And I remember saying to Jesus, I'm so homesick. I feel so lonely. I'm really going to sit now. I remember having a busy party. And I remember telling him I felt so strange in a strange land. Knew little bits of the language, but they spoke a different language. They didn't understand English culture. So you felt alienated, misunderstood, and all these emotions. And I was just pouring out my heart to the Lord. And when I finished, I felt the Lord say to me, Have you finished now? Now let me talk to you about loneliness. I left the world with and I came into a world that I created, by the way. He said, if nobody wanted me, I was called a man of sorrows, and I am a man of sorrows, pointed with grief. I was rejected, misunderstood, misrepresented. Nobody understood my language either. When I talked to them, they didn't understand me. He said, you want to talk about loneliness? Let me tell you how lonely I was. You know, at the end of that, I was silent. I was a little bit like Joe. close my mouth. And at the end of that, I had a revelation and understanding and appreciation more to worship him. Because I suddenly realized that there wasn't anything that I felt that he hadn't felt and did I still felt. Amen. That's why I can put my hope in him. That's why I can turn to him and say, Lord, this is how I'm really feeling. And he says, I already know it, Jesus. And the Bible says he ever liveth to make intercession for us. And he's touched, touched with the feelings of our infirmities. Those of you tonight have given prayer requests, husband got answer, all those things. He is touched. He doesn't just say, oh yeah, okay, that's better than God. No, you know, 
No, no, he's touched. He stops. He listens. He cares. He's a God of compassion. He's moved to tears. And he's praying for you. And he's praying for us. 24 7. So don't ever think nobody's ever praying for you. Because the Bible says that Jesus ever lived to make intercession for the saints. Praise God. We have a sure hope. It's a certainty. It's not I hope so. It's a surety. It's a sure hope. It's an anchored hope. It says in Psalm 119 and verse 14, those who reverently and worshipfully fear will see me and be glad because I have hoped in your word, tarried for it, waited expectantly and confidently for it. Hope in his word. Sometimes, you know, we listen to messages and we listen to the word of God. Maybe we even read the word of God and close the book and think, well, that was nice. But do we really put our hope in it and tarry for it and wait expectantly for the fulfillment of it in our lives? You see, the word of God is not just a dead letter, it's a living word. It's life. And when you take a hold of those promises and you believe this is God speaking and you dare to believe that it's speaking to you, and that he can do that when he says in that book, in your life, there's an expectation, there's a faith that rises. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of the Lord. And faith stirs and rises, and when we put our hope in God, and say, oh Lord, it looks hopeless, but oh, you promised it, Lord. And because of who you are, I'm putting my hope in you. Now, Lord, be it unto me, according to your word, Lord. You know, it thrills the heart of God when we come in faith. It says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Him that cometh to God must believe he is God. He is who he claims to be. He is that sure hope. Says, and I take pleasure, delight in those who reverently and worshipfully fear me, who hope in my mercy and loving kindness, in my unfailing love. It says we exercise our faith by an act of our will that we come into this experience. This experience. 1 Corinthians 15 and 19 says, If Christ is not raised, we have no hope. But we serve a living God. Amen? We serve a living God. That's what makes Christianity different from every cult and every religion of the world. You can go to a tomb where maybe the founders bury, but there ain't a tomb. Even though they may go to Israel and they've got some kind of thing that they've got and say, This is where it was. We don't know, but I tell you, it's empty anyway. Because Jesus is alive today. We serve a really living Savior. And because he's living, we have a living hope, the Bible says. Not only a sure hope, but a living hope. It's a breathing hope. And we have a blessed hope, because one day he's coming. Hallelujah. The unsaved are without hope, because they're without Christ. But you and I tonight put our confidence and our trust in him. We have this hope. You know, this hope does not put us in a rocking chair where we rock away until we get to heaven and think, well, that's wonderful. It puts us in a battleground. It puts us in the nitty gritty of life amongst people who are going through the same things we're going through so that we will shine as light and we will exude that hope. Because they're going to look at you and I and say, well, how come you've got a smile on your face? How come you can talk the way you talk? And I know the crisis you're going through. What makes you different? And then we have an, an opportunity to say, ah, oh, yeah, crisis are real. I have pressures too. I have problems too. Problems come to the unrighteous and the righteous, amen? God is allowing it. Yes, the sickness and trials and financial problems. But God puts us in the midst of it all to shine for him and be different. Because we have something different or someone that's going to bring us through that. Someone we can lean on. Whereas the world out there, oh, we have hope. I feel sorry for people over in Denver right now that don't know Jesus Christ. I can't even imagine what it would be like to lose someone and have a child killed and have someone. I can't imagine what it would be like to go through life and go through trials and crises and problems without Christ. And many are. That's why they're committing suicide. That's why they're turning to alcohol. That's why they're turning to drugs. That's why they're topping themselves because they just want to escape it because it's an overload for them. The psyche can't take it. They end up in political somewhere similar. I can understand that, but praise God we have someone who will never test us above that we're able to bear. Someone who will be there for us. Someone in the storm that will speak peace into our hearts. You know what, like any anchor, our hope moves us forward. It doesn't hold us back. It doesn't just put us in a position like the anchor of a ship. 
that ship can't move. It's not that kind of hope. The anchor is not that kind of anchor. We are anchored upward and forward, and we are moving forward because the hope is set before us. It's leading us on. Amen. It's not keeping us fixed until we get to heaven. It's different. And Peter describes the living hope in 1 Peter 1, 3 and 4. This living Son of God who arose from the dead. Oh, praise God. A living hope. You know, time destroys most hopes, doesn't it? I hear people say to me, well, I used to believe all that. I used to trust and I used to be in church. But you know, a year went by, ten years went by. God didn't seemingly seem to care. Didn't answer my, my prayer straight away, so I gave up. And they lose hope. But you know, this sure living hope that we have but becomes more glorious, the Bible says, through the passing of time. In 1 Peter 1 4, it says, The passing of time makes it more glorious. The hope doesn't fade away because of the passing of time, because ours is steadfast and sure and anchored upward and forward, and it becomes more glorious. In other words, the longer it takes for God to answer the prayer, the more glory he's going to get because he's took time. And we can hold on to that, can't we? God's not looking down on us as a church and thinking, I'll put you on an endurance course. Let's see who can make it. Let's see who can start. Let's see. Let's pile on the prayer. That's not the kind of God I serve. He's not a cruel God. He's a good God. When I'm on an endurance course, the pressures and the trials are purposeful in God. So we will know what it is to be anchored in God. So we'll know what it is to experience his presence and his peace and his joy and make a difference for him. We are included tonight in Christ's last will and testament. Oh, praise God. You didn't know me. You're looking at a very rich lady, you know. You didn't know that, did you, Paulie? I tell you, talk about millionaire, I'm more than a trillionaire. I am a rich lady tonight because I share in the inheritance in Christ. And it might not be in that West. In fact, I don't want to put it in that West. I don't want to put it in. I tell you, we have a bank in heaven that, I tell you, no tax deductions. It ain't going to go bust. I tell you, when we invest in Him, when we serve Him, when we lay up treasure in heaven, in whatever we do, not talking about pounds and pence now, I'm talking about just living for Jesus, which is worship. I tell you, when we invest in Him, and even our tears, the Bible says, are bottled. I think God's got screens and bathtubs for mine. I tell you, the tears have shed. He ain't got bottles. He's run out of bottles. There's probably lakes up there. But he bottles them every tear. Every single tear. Nothing can ruin our inheritance. It's not earthly. It says it doesn't grow old. It's eternal. It can't wear out. It can't disappoint in any way. And he goes on to say in 1 Peter 1, 5 and 9... He goes on to talk about this inheritance, and this is why we can have such a show. It's all wrapped up in a, world, in a word called salvation. It goes on to talk in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, through faith. We've come by grace through faith. Our salvation is not complete. Did you know that? You've probably heard this from my very mouth over the years as I've come to this fellowship. Your salvation tonight is not complete yet. It's threefold. Hope you know that. You have been saved from the penalty of sin. You've been justified, just as if you never sinned. You are being saved, being saved from the power of sin in your life. The more you decrease and he increases, you're overcoming daily those things that would bind you. And you're being changed from glory to glory. It's called sanctification. But we will be saved from the very presence of sin when we're glorified. Justified, sanctified, glorified. In Christ, we are all those things right now. But we're working out our salvation, the Bible says, with fear and trembling. What does that mean? It means God's piling on the pressure and it's purposeful in God. And in the midst of it all, he's changing our nature into the nature of Jesus. And we become more like him. God's getting us ready for glory. And when we get up there, we're going to get a new body. Oh, glory to God, calling that our Christ saying, go be there. We watch us eat your hearts out. We're going to zoom around. We are going to be up there. No pain, no tears, no sickness. What a blessed hope. But down here, we have a sure living hope. Oh, praise God. Wrapped up in salvation. So how can I be sure that he'll come through for me? How can I be sure that he even sees me? And I believe one of the saddest things as I travel around churches 
is that so many believers have never been grounded and never been anchored in the Word. And because of this, they don't have an inkling of just who this God is. They have never been taught the attributes, the characteristics of God. You know, when we are taught who this God is, then we are going to be able to put our hope in it. And there are many, many characteristics. And there are many, many attributes. It's who our God is. You see, He doesn't just have love, He is love. He just does have mercy, He is mercy. He's a just God. He has to do what's right. He's a righteous God. He's a compassionate God. He's a faithful God. And then go on and on and on and list the attributes of God. But we're going to spend the remaining time looking at only one. And there are many. But this one is even enough. We're going to look at his faithfulness. Can I put my hope in this God? Yes. Why? How do I know he'll come through for me? Because of his faithfulness. Because of who he is. That word faithful means reliable, utterly trustworthy, one who can never and will never fail. How do I know I can put my trust in God? Because of who he is. He can't deny who he is. If he ceases to be faithful in my life, then he ceases to be who he is. And he's a liar and he's not a man that he should lie. He has to be true to himself. That's why I can lean hard on him. That's why I can put my hope and my trust in him, because of who he is. Oh, and when you get that as a solid foundation in your walk, and that's only one attribute, you are going to grow in faith, and you are going to lean hard on him, and you are going to grow in Christ, and become more confident in your walk, and more victorious in your daily lives. Lamentations 3 and 23 says, Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. Great is thy faithfulness. I love that song. I've said to Steve often, you know, we talk. I've said to him, you do talk, you know, now and again. We live in the same house. I know more when he gives the notices out about what he's doing and I live with him, Gary. Oh, see, he never told me that, didn't I? He never said that. He never said that. He'll give the notices out. I was spoken to him. I said, yeah, you love him. Oh, did you? And I didn't know. And they all laugh. I said, I only live with him. But nevertheless, we do talk. And one of the things I've said to him, if I keep the bucket before you, put me in the box and say, Grace, is thy faithfulness. It's my favourite hymn alongside the old big cross. Great is thy faithfulness. The Amplified says his tender compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great and abundant is your stability, O God, and your faithfulness. And Malachi 3 and 6 says, I am the Lord of God, and I do not change. He's never changed. From eternity past, he never was born. He's always been and he always will be. He never changes. He never ceases to be who he is. And one of those characteristics and attributes is faithful. So because of who he is, did you know the whole world today, the whole world enjoys daily the benefits from God's faithfulness, the righteous and the unrighteous, seed time and harvest, summer and winter, Springtime and harvest, sun, moon, and stars in their glory above. Join with all nature in manifold witness daily to what? Thy great faithfulness. Mercy and love, amen. The very fact that the moon comes up and the sun, praise God for the sun, but it's always there. The sun's always there, it's just the clouds getting in the way. Amen. The sun's always there, the stars are always there, the trees, you plant a daffodil, bulb, but becomes a daffodil. The very nature itself is declaring and speaking to us, and we have eyes to say, I am faithful on the unbelievers and on the believers. If that sun didn't come out tomorrow, this world wouldn't exist. Amen? If that will cease to be, just like that, governs all the tides and everything, chaos, the world just wouldn't perform. Because of his faithfulness, we can rely upon his faithfulness. Deuteronomy 7, 9 says, God himself has called himself faithful. Your God is God. He is the faithful God. A faithful God, Deuteronomy says in verse 4, who never does any wrong. It's impossible for God ever to make a mistake. I can put my hope in him. He is faithful, Psalm 33 and 4. In all he does. Hang on a minute, G. But I, but I've got a problem and there's a sickness and this happens and that right. He's faithful in all he gets, in all he does. All things work together for good. They don't taste good. I've often used this illustration in our kids.
kids club when I come in with a bag of bike cups, so we're gonna come in with a bag of salt and flour and eggs and, and, and a book of lard and, and I said, oh look at all these, who wants to taste this? And I said, who wants a teaspoon of fat? <laughs> who wants a teaspoon of salt? And then I mix them all together and break the egg and stir them all up, put them in the oven, and that comes the cake. Who wants a piece of cake? Oh yeah. The ingredients alone don't taste good. But he's mixing it all together for love. He says, oh, taste and see that the love is good. What you're going through might just be the salt of it. Might just be a little bit of the ingredient. But God's plan for you is a good plan. Why? Because he's faithful. He can do no wrong. He loves you. He loves me. He remains faithful forever in all he does. From generation to generation, it says in the Psalm 119, from generation to generation, you have established the earth and it stands. It's never out of date. Now let's apply that faithfulness to our hopelessness of what it means to be. Some person one time gave a definition and I loved it. I wrote it down. Faithfulness is that in God which guarantees that God will never be or act inconsistent with himself. Good for you now, good for tomorrow, good for the day you die. Good for when you rise from the dead and good for you throughout eternity. Faithfulness is that in God which guarantees that God will always act consistent with himself. He will never cease to be what he is. He will never cease to perform what he says. Everything God says he will do according to his faithfulness. He will always be true to himself and to his word and to his character. Can you put your hope in that kind of God tonight? Because I certainly can. God is his own standard. God swore by himself, by two things, his oath and his promise. If you go to court, they give you a Bible, don't you swear by something higher, don't you? But there's nothing higher than God. God actually swore by himself. He took an oath with himself. There's nobody higher than him. He swore by himself. God is influenced by nobody. And he's absolutely perfect in his character. You know, but sadly, a lot of churches tend to just zoom in on one of the characteristics of God and that's all they preach about is grace, grace, grace. And he is grace. And he is mercy. And he is love. But he's all those things. And if we just take one of those things and exclude the others, we have a distorted view of God. A distorted view of God. Give you a little illustration here. If we were to just minister concerning justice, justice, he said, just God, prepare to meet your God, hell and heaven. All those things are true. But if that's all people heard, they come and think he's a tyrant, aren't they? Oh, you know. Because that's all they heard. But there has to be a balance. There has to be a balance. On the other hand, if we all mean focus on love, 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 we've got a kind of sentimental, spineless God, it don't matter what you do, he loves you. He'll always be there, and we've got this kind of Portrayal of God that the Christian scientists have, all sweetness and kissy poo. He's a just God. He draws a line sometimes. He says, My spirit will not always strive with man. In my mercy and in my grace, I'll keep reaching, I'll keep speaking, but I'll draw a line and I say, No more. That's why we can't, we can choose when we come to Him. We only come when the Spirit's drawn us. You can't say, I'll make my mind up and come next week and decide to be saved. No, no, you might not get next week. You come when the Word and the Spirit are working. If we make him all good, all good, and he is all these things. We've got a sentimentalist, we've got a modernist, we've got a liberal. We've got this kind of God that people think, well, in order to have this God, they've got to throw out the Old Testament because God would never send fire on Sodom and Gomorrah. And God would never send a man into the nations to annihilate men, women, and children. God would never do that. So they exclude the Old Testament. Not too long ago, somebody came to me after preaching and said, Gene, have a New Testament Christian you. And I said, what? What do you mean? New Testament Christian. I said, you can't be a New Testament Christian without the old. You can't have the new without the old. It's the old counsel of God, isn't it? But I knew what they meant. I've come under grace, it's not law. I've come under grace, not law. But Jesus fulfilled every letter. And the law is a standard, and none of us will ever keep it. That's why Jesus came. But him in us will enable us to fulfill the law, amen? To please the holy God. Yes, yeah, so if we've only got one attribute, one dimension of the characteristic of God, 
God, and we exclude the other, even grapes. I love, I love Joyce Meyer once listening to her once. We don't have the God channel. It was in Doreen's. And I, I've not listened to many of her messages, but I had to be listening to her talking about grace. And she said, we've majored that much on grace. It's a disgrace in the church. Because we've just thought, grace, grace, grace. Always grace, always grace, always grace. And yes, he is grace. And yes, he is mercy. And yes, he is just. And yes, he is all those things. All together as one. Well. And I can put my faith and I can put my trust in him. And even when I'm faithless, he's faithful. Isn't that wonderful one? Even when you're faithless, I will be faithful. What a sure hope we have. What a sure hope we have. He'll be faithful to sinners. God is declared because he's just. He will banish from his presence all who love sin and reject his son. He will be faithful to do that because of his faithfulness. If we don't acknowledge our sin and our need of him and receive his gift, free gift of salvation, he will be faithful, this is his faithfulness, to banish everybody from his presence who lost eternity in Because of who he is. Because he's faithful. He'll be faithful to the backslider, those who put their trust in him, that if we do sin, and we do sin even as Christians, 1 John 1 and 9 says, if I confess my sin, I'll be faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. In other words, even as believers, his faithfulness guarantees that if we will be honest with him, he'll forgive us and cleanse us because it's a living hope. And it's living blood. And the blood avails for me every moment of every day. He will be faithful. Faithful to forgive us and to cleanse us. He will be faithful according to Corinthians. When I am tempted, he said, and I will not suffer thee to be tempted above what you are able to bear. But I will make a way of escape for you. You'll not be crushed with the pressure and the problem. Because of my faithfulness, I'll make a way out for you. And if there isn't a way out, it's because he's put you in it and he's doing the work in your heart. And when the work's done, he'll make a way out. I praise God I can put my hope in him because of his faithfulness. That when I'm going through a problem, I don't look at the devil, I look at God. And I say, thank you, Lord. This is tough, but you've allowed it. And it won't get more than I can bear because you're faithful. You'll make a way out for me. He's got to be faithful even to those who are in ministry. And I particularly love this verse in 1 Thessalonians 5. Faithful as he who called you. And he also will do it. When there's a calling on your life and there's a work he's entrusted into your hands. Faithful as he who called you. He will do it. He will complete that work through you because of his faithfulness. In other words, God said, I called you to a job and I'll finish it in you. Isn't that a wonderful truth? Believe him for who he is tonight. Believe him because of what he said. Put your hope in him. Be anchored in him. Be anchored up and forward. Amen. Because of who he is. Because of what he said and because of his faithfulness. We can put our hope in him. One of the chorus that I've got written down here that's become one of my favourites is what I think the chorus says. One of the new ones, but I love it. Faithful God, so unchanging. Ageless one, you're my rock of peace. Lord of all, I depend on you. And I call out to you again and again. You are my rock in times of trouble. You lift me up when I fall down. And all through the storm, your love, your faithfulness, is the anchor. My hope is in you alone. God bless you, prayer. Thank you for your words tonight, Lord. Thank you for your word, your promise in your word, that this word will not return to you, God, but will accomplish that which is purpose to do in our lives. Thank you, it's a living word. May God speak to us even as we go on through our belief and the weeks to come. And then we discover the power and the reality of this world tonight. But I hope we do. And when we think it's hopeless, it's with the struggle. And as the song is said, hope and love. Thank you, Lord, and we put our hope in you. Because of your faithfulness. Because you went to the cross for us. Because we belong to your family. Because you paid the price. Thank you for the shepherd of the Lord Jesus Christ.
and because of the cross, we have been brought in to a relationship with this wonderful, wonderful Jesus in us, the Holy Ghost.